Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to New Life. It's so good to have you joining us this morning, whether you're here in the building or you're watching online from somewhere else. We're just so grateful for this chance to connect with you. And uh, we have Easter coming up just one week from today, which is hard to believe, but we are so excited for what God has in store for Easter weekend. We've got four chances for you to connect with our Easter services, Saturday at 5 p.m. and then Sunday morning at 8, 9.30 and 11, 8, 9.30 and 11. And uh, it's going to be an incredible incredible, incredible weekend. We've got a nursery for the little kids and then the older kids we're going to have here with us in service. We've got a special thing we're doing for them in service. We've got giveaways for all the kids. Uh, our worship team is going to be singing their new song that they wrote, produced, and released this last week. It's going to be an incredible week. And so we're so excited, anticipating great things for it. And I'm going to ask you if you would help us out in the coming week to help us prepare for Easter by doing me some favors. Number one, would you please this week make it a point to be praying for our Easter services. We are, we are doing incredible, I mean, God, we're believing God's going to do incredible things, and we're doing some things we've never done before, like a Saturday service and all that kind of stuff, and uh, we just want to pave the way in prayer. We believe that when we pray, God will show up, and he will do incredible things, so be praying for our team that's making things happen. Be praying for uh, God's just leading and direction and his anointing upon every step, and for all the people that are going to be coming, which leads me to the second thing I'm going to ask you to do, not only pray, but invite people to come and join you. Uh, one of my prayers throughout this last week has been that God would divinely orchestrate people crossing paths with you over the next week, people who are looking for hope, people who need the, the power of Jesus to be at work in their lives so that you can extend an invitation for them to come to church. So if you have friends, family members, coworkers, neighbors, somebody that you know that doesn't have a church home, we just want to encourage you, invite them to come on Easter weekend, and it's going to be an incredible experience for them, and we believe God is going to use you through your invitations to change some lives for eternity. And, and what God could do through a simple invitation is just incredible. So invite people. And then lastly, um, if you don't already have your Easter plans locked in, or you don't already know what service you're going to or whatever, um, we're asking you to help us make room for all of the guests and all the people we're going to have by considering attending our Saturday evening, five o'clock or our Sunday morning, eight o'clock service. And here's the reason I'm saying that. Um, most of the people who aren't already a part of New Life and who are going to be guests with us on uh, Easter weekend, we're anticipating that they're going to come at the 9.30 or 11 o'clock service. So we believe those services are probably going to be pretty full. There's going to be room in the Saturday and Sunday morning 8 o'clock service. That's what we're anticipating. So one of the great ways that we can host people well is by just making sure we have enough room for everybody. Of course, we're going to have overflow seating and we're going to find a place for people to sit and for people to be if they show up. But we do want to provide a safe and socially distant environment for people who, for many of them, this is going to be their first time coming to a large-scale gathering since this whole pandemic started. So uh, if you don't already have plans uh, and you can join us for Saturday or Sunday morning at 8, uh, we'd appreciate you helping us make room in the 9, 30, and 11. So excited about Easter, but I'm also excited about today because I believe God wants to do some great things today as well as we continue in in our Easter series, Re uh, Rescue excuse me. And uh, today, if you'll turn your Bibles with me to Isaiah chapter 53, uh, and the title of our message today is The Right Kind. The Right Kind. Now, as we, um, as we have been in this last year, there's been a lot of crazy things that have happened in this last year, but uh, over, just a little over a year ago, I got the opportunity to do something that I'd never done before, and that was travel outside of the United States. Got to go to Tanzania. And uh, if you've been a part of New Life this last year, you've probably heard us talk about Tanzania and the project that we gave to as a church towards there. But uh, if you've never traveled overseas before, there's just a lot of things that are different when you go to a different country. Of course, you expect, you know, maybe that the language is going to be different or some of the customs or those things are going to be a little different. But one of the th you know, sometimes it's just the, the littlest things that are completely different from what you're used to. And one of the things that kind of threw me off a little bit was trying to plan for going over to Tanzania and having like my phone with me to be able to take pictures and my computer to take notes and that kind of stuff. And realizing that I couldn't just take my cords that I had with me uh, now and just go overseas and plug them into the wall and expect that they were going to work. And that's because 
because the way that we have our outlets configured here in the United States and plugs and all that stuff is different than it is in many other places in the world. One of those things we just take for granted, we don't think about, but is different everywhere. And so in, in Tanzania, there is electricity. There's plenty of power there. There was plenty of opportunity for me to be able to charge my phone or my computer. But in order to do it, I had to get one of these things. This is an adapter. And on this end, you see, uh, you can see the prongs. They're kind of configured differently than they would be here in the United States. And that would plug into the wall uh, in Tanzania. And then I would plug my plug in on, on this end. Uh, so, you know, the problem wasn't that there wasn't electricity or power. There was, but the problem was I wasn't able to connect to it without the right kind of adapter. And that became an issue because when I tried to find adapters, I found, and this one came with all of these ones as well. There's probably 10 or different ones, 10 or 12 different ones in there. And only this one worked in Tanzania. So you got to find the right kind of adapter if you're going to be able to connect to the power, to the electricity there, if I was going to be able to take pictures on my phone and all that kind of stuff. And in a similar way, when, when we find ourselves trying to connect ourselves with God, we talked last week about this reality that sin disconnects us from God, that every single one of us finds ourselves in a place where we have chosen to live our lives our way instead of God's way. And when we do that, that disconnects us from God. It, it, it brings us to a point where we're not experiencing the blessings and the favor of God in our lives in the ways that we could be, and it sets us on a path for eternity eternal destruction. The, the, the just consequences for what we deserve when we choose our way instead of God's way is destruction because God, as the righteous and just God that he is, will judge sin and evil in this world. He's not just going to let sin happen and say that's no big deal. He's going to judge sin and evil in this world. But we talked even last week, starting in Genesis chapter 3, from the very beginning, there was this picture that though our sin disconnected us from God, God wanted to provide a way for us to experience his power again. And in Genesis 3.15, we talked about how, how the serpent may strike at the heel, but there was going to come one that was going to crush the head of the serpent. And as we get to Isaiah chapter 53 today, we're going to talk a little bit, not just about the reality that we all need a rescue, which is what we talked about last week, but we're going to talk about how we all need the right kind of rescue. We all need the right kind of rescuer to come and to be able to actually help us move forward in what God wants for us and, 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 and connecting with God once again. Because the reality is, in the world that we live in, we, we try to escape or we try to rescue ourselves from our brokenness or our pain or our lack of peace. We try to find all kinds of different things that can be a rescue for us. Maybe we try to find a rescue in a relationship. Maybe we try to find a rescue in having enough money in our bank account. Maybe we try to find a rescue in just escaping from the stresses of the world and going to entertainment or going to substances or, or going to some other kind of thing. There's all kinds of ways that we try to rescue ourselves from the pain or the hopelessness in this world. But if we're truly going to be made right again, if we're going to be able to experience God's power in our lives, then we've got to have the right kind of rescue. And as we look at Isaiah chapter 53 today, what we see is that only Jesus could bring the rescue that we needed. Only Jesus could. There's all kinds of things that we could turn to. We could try to make ourselves good enough. We could turn to somebody that we know is a really good person. We, we could try to do all kinds of things to rescue ourselves from the pain and the anguish and the sin and the brokenness that we found ourselves in. But the reality is only Jesus can bring us the rescue that we need. And as we look at Isaiah chapter 53, uh, Isaiah the prophet is going to talk to us about this coming rescuer and about what needed to be done for us to be able to be rescued from the destruction that we have deserved in our life by choosing our way instead of God's way. And as Isaiah writes this, we got to remember, this, Isaiah's writing this hundreds of years before Jesus is even on the scene, before he's been born. Isaiah is writing about this generations before Jesus shows up, talking about the kind of rescue that we need. And as we read this passage in Isaiah 53, it almost sounds like he's describing the life of Jesus after the fact. But instead, this is God speaking to his people saying, this is the kind of rescue that is coming. So we turn to Isaiah chapter 53 and starting in verse 1, it says this, 
Who has believed us, or who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? In other words, he's saying, there's this message that's gone out. Who's heard this message and who's actually believed it? The arm of the Lord kind of is the picture of the, the work of God, that God is working in the world. And he's saying, who's heard this message? Who's believed this message? Because this message for many people is pretty unbelievable. Now, what's the message? He starts the message in verse two. He says, for he grew up up before him like a young plant. Now he's starting to describe the rescuer that's going to come. He says, the rescuer grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Now, this is an interesting way to start talking about the rescue that God is going to send us, the rescuer that's going to come and bring us out of this place of darkness and brokenness that we found ourselves into. Because if we think of a rescuer, oftentimes when we think of a rescue mission, we think of, you know, maybe the army or, or, or some great uh, battle that's going to happen where these people are going to just ride in as conquerors with an army behind them and overwhelm the forces that are against the rescue. If we think of that like in a movie or something like that. That. But the reality is Jesus didn't quite show up that way. Jesus didn't show up as a king who had already conquered and as a king who had an army with him to just swoop in and, and make everything happen in the big picture of what we would expect oftentimes. Jesus instead showed up as a baby in a manger. He showed up born in a small town to a poor family. Jesus didn't show up the way that we would typically think of a rescuer showing up. He showed up humbly. And what we see in these first few verses of Isaiah's prophecy talking about the coming rescuer is that Jesus' rescue mission started with humility. It started with humility. Jesus came as the baby in the manger. We know the Christmas story. But as we continue on in what Isaiah has to say, he says, he's like a root out of dry ground. In other words, this wasn't the, the, the way that everybody would have expected this great grand rescue to come, just a little plant growing up out of dry ground. And if you, as you see a plant growing up out of dry ground, you think that's nothing. This is going to pass away. It's not anything significant. Jesus didn't show up maybe in the way that many people would have expected. It says he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. For most people, that, that when Jesus came to the earth, they didn't even know about him. Now, there were some people who understood what was going on. The angels spoke to the shepherds in the field. There were the wise men that came. Mary and Joseph had a sense of what was going on. Some people knew that this wasn't just another baby. But the majority of people in the world, the majority of people even around Israel at that time had no idea who this little baby was. This was just some insignificant baby born to a poor family in a small town. Nobody would have expected this incredible thing to come or this incredible rescue to come from Jesus. There was nothing about him in his beginnings that was setting up most people to understand him to be this great rescuer. Now, to those whom God revealed it, the shepherds and others, they had an idea. But even then, the disciples, those closest to Jesus, didn't expect this to happen exactly the way that it did. Now, in verse 3, it says, He was despised, rejected by man, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. As Jesus grew up, as he, as he started to, to go through childhood and become a man, and as he started even his ministry... Those who were in charge of the spiritual care of the people of God, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, and the chief priests, and the elders, and the teachers of the law, those who, who should have known better and who should have been able to point the people to God, they didn't like Jesus. They rejected him. They, they didn't want to have anything to do with him. They wanted to stop the ministry that was happening. And so this picture of someone from whom men hide their faces, it was like this picture of people, you know, when somebody walks into a room and you're like, oh man, not that person. I don't want to see them. You know, it was kind of that idea that Jesus among a number of people was pictured in that way. 
People didn't always want to be around him. Now, Jesus did attract a following. Jesus did attract a lot of people that wanted to be around him. But those who were the right kind of people that people would have said were the right kind of people, the religious leaders and stuff, they rejected him. Many of his own people, and in fact, even in his hometown, Jesus was rejected. Jesus' rescue mission started in humility. Now, why does that matter? It matters because we have to recognize that even in Jesus taking on flesh, becoming a human and walking this earth was a great act of humility. The rescue mission didn't start when we reached out to God. The rescue mission started when God reached down to us. When God humbled himself in the person of Jesus coming down to this earth. You see, if we're going to have the right kind of rescue, the right kind of rescue doesn't start with me. It doesn't start with you. It doesn't start with you trying to make your life better. It doesn't start with you trying to do better or be a good person. The right kind of rescue doesn't start with you trying harder or you reading your Bible more. The right kind of rescue doesn't start with you being in church more often. The right kind of rescue starts with God reaching down into our brokenness, entering into our situation and meeting us where we are. Jesus humbled himself, and he came to us. And that's how the rescue started. And that's so vital that we understand that, because if we think that the rescue didn't start with God reaching down to us, then we'll think that in some way we can reach ourselves to God. We can work hard enough. We can do enough good things. We can position our lives to be good enough in some kind of way where where God kind of honors our efforts and says, okay, I guess you can come this way. But that's not the truth of the gospel. The truth of the gospel is that there was nothing we could do. We were completely helpless and hopeless. There was nothing that we could do to rescue ourselves. So God humbled himself and he came for us. That's the right kind of rescue, the kind of rescue we needed. Now, We continue on in verse 4. It says, Surely he, this rescuer, Jesus, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. In other words, when Jesus was walking on this earth, when he went to the cross, people looked at him and said, He's getting what he deserves. But Jesus wasn't getting what he deserved. He was taking on what we deserve. So some people looked at him and said, well, he's getting what he deserves. But that wasn't the case. They considered him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. And then in verse uh, 5 it says, but he was crushed for our transgressions. Or he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one, every single one to his own way. And the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. When you look at the story of Jesus, the rescue that Jesus came to bring, you realize and understand that Jesus didn't come to set us a good example. He didn't come just to teach us some good things. Jesus didn't just come to, to say, you know, try to be better. Jesus came to give of, him very, of his very self so that we could experience life. Jesus came to sacrifice for us. Jesus' rescue mission required sacrifice. There was no way for us to be rescued unless Jesus was willing to sacrifice himself for us. Now, we talked about this last week, and we're getting into a lot of theology this week that we could spend weeks and weeks and weeks talking about. But we talked about this last week that every single one of us has chosen to sin. We've chosen to live our lives our way instead of God's way. And the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. What we justly and rightfully deserve by living our lives for ourselves instead of for God is death. And not just death as in ceasing to exist on this earth, but death in the sense of eternal separation from God in hell. We all deserved that penalty. Because God is holy and he is righteous and he is just, God does not just let sin and evil and brokenness happen and say, well, I guess that's not a big deal. God has to do something about it. There has to be something to make it right again. 
But because of God's great love for us, that penalty we deserved, Jesus took on himself. Jesus came to be a sacrifice for you and for me. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In Isaiah 53, in these verses we just read, we see that Jesus came not because he needed to come to pay for his own sins or to pay for his own wrongs or to pay for something that he had done. Jesus came to be a sacrifice for you and for me. Jesus' rescue mission required that he sacrifice because the sacrifice was him paying the penalty that you deserve, that I deserve, and paying it for us instead. Which leads us to the next verses. In verse 7 it says, He, this rescuer Jesus, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. And yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In other words, this, these words oppression, he was afflicted, are pointing to the fact that Jesus was unjustly punished for something he didn't do. As we continue on in verse 8, it says, By oppression and by judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, in other words, for those who are seeing this happen, he's going to ask a question. He says, for those who saw this happen, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living? Or in other words, who would have thought that he was dying so that he could be stricken for the transgression of my people? When people saw this happening, when people saw Jesus going to the cross, they weren't looking at this going, oh, you know, maybe maybe he's doing this for me. They were thinking to themselves, no, he's He's getting what he deserves. But yet in verse 9 it says, They made his grave with the wicked. They put him on a cross between two criminals. And then it says, And with the rich man in his death, Jesus buried in the tomb of of a rich man. And it says, Although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. The reality is, Jesus died as a criminal. He was executed by the Roman government like he was a criminal, but he was completely innocent. He was completely innocent. He did not deserve it in any way. And and the reality is that's so important because Jesus' rescue mission demanded his complete innocence. Jesus couldn't become the sacrifice that would free us from our sins if he deserved the punishment of sin himself. Jesus couldn't give us new life if he needed to suffer the penalties of death for himself because that's what he had earned for himself. Jesus could only become the right kind of sacrifice if he was the perfect sacrifice, if he was the innocent lamb of God that was slain for us. And this is so important for us to understand because in the world that we live in today, many people, as you, if you talk about Jesus, have great things to say about Jesus. They say, well, he was a good guy. He was a great teacher. He did some really cool things. But the reality is Jesus was so much more than just a good guy. He was so much more than just a great teacher. He was so much more than just somebody who did some good things. Jesus was completely perfect sinless in every single way. He lived his life in a way that you and I never could. And he took upon himself the just punishment that we deserved. Why did he do this? We see as we continue on in verse 10. It says, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. So this idea that this was the will of the Lord, this was the plan of God from the very beginning. We read it again in Genesis 3 last week that there was going to come the rescuer who was going to crush the head of the serpent. It was God's plan from the very beginning to bring this kind of rescue. And it says, when his soul makes an offering for guilt, so when Jesus dies for us to be an offering for our guilt, it says, he, the rescuer, shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his 
his days. In other words, Jesus wasn't going to stay in the tomb. He was going to raise from the dead again, and he was going to see his offspring, or he was going to see all those that would choose to follow him from that point forward. Jesus wasn't going to stay in the grave. Jesus was going to conquer the grave. And when Jesus conquered the grave, it prolonged the days of his life. And when it prolonged the days of his life, as he sits in heaven now, Jesus offers us the same thing that he himself received. In verse 11, it says, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. Through the anguish and the pain of what he had to go through, the wrath and the the judgment of the Father on sin was completely satisfied. And then it says, by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. By the one who was innocent, who deserved no punishment at all, but yet took the punishment shall all of those who did deserve the punishment be counted as righteous or having right standing before God. And it says, he will bear their iniquities. Not his own, but theirs. Verse 12, he says, therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. In other words, the the riches that were rightfully his, he's going to offer to those who identify with him. And to those who identify with him, he's going to take the punishment that was theirs and he's going to take it on himself. This is what Martin Luther calls the great exchange. God's righteousness, God's blessings, the power of what he has in store for us exchange for our sin and our brokenness that Jesus takes on himself. It says, because he poured out his soul to death and he was numbered with the transgressors because he identified himself with us as sinners, yet he bore the sin of many and he makes intercession for the transgressors. Jesus then stands in the gap between us and a God that we could not connect to because we disconnected ourselves because of our sin. Jesus stands in the gap and he connects us again. He becomes the connecting point that allows us to connect to the power of God that we disconnected ourselves from when we chose sin and brokenness. This only works if we have the right kind of rescuer. And what we see is that Jesus' rescue mission needed to restore what was lost. When we chose sin and we disconnected ourselves from God, what was lost was the blessings of God in our lives, the favor of God in our lives. What we lost was our connection with God and everything that is good and beautiful. What we lost was the life that God wanted for each and every one of us. Jesus' rescue mission is only a rescue mission, truly a rescue, if he connects us again with the power of God that can transform us and change us and help us to experience his blessing once again. Jesus was the right kind of rescuer. He connects us with God the Father once again. Completely innocent, he becomes the sinless sacrifice for our guilt so that he can be the intercessor, the one that stands between and connects the two sides back together once again. Jesus willingly came to give himself for you. Last week we talked about this reality that every single one of us has sinned. Every single one of us has fallen short of God's goodness and his glory and what he wants for our lives. Every single one of us is guilty. And the only hope that we have is that Jesus took the guilt on himself. He paid the penalty for us so that we could have the righteousness of God that he could offer to us. But this only works because of Jesus. There's no other way. There's no other way to connect with God again. There's no other way to make things right. There's no other way to work ourselves hard enough or to to try to do enough good things or to try to check enough religious boxes. There's no other way for us to truly be rescued. The only way that we can find rescue is in Jesus And so my challenge this morning to each one of you, whether you're here in this room or you're watching online right now, is to turn to Jesus to find true rescue. In our lives, we will oftentimes turn to a lot of things to try to find relief, to try to find rescue from our pain or our brokenness or or the the lack of peace that we have. We'll turn to, to all kinds of different things. 
But many of those things, maybe they're not even bad in and of themselves, but every single one of those things will only offer at best temporary relief. If we want to find true rescue, if we want to truly be restored to the life that God wants for each and every one of us, a life where we're filled with his joy, a life where we experience his blessing, a life where we're connected with him and we see the power of God at work in our lives. If we truly want to experience what Jesus calls life and life to the fullest, then we can only experience it when we turn to Jesus to be our rescuer. So what does this mean for each one of us? Well, maybe this morning you find yourself in a time or in a place or a situation in life where you've been turning to a lot of other things to try to rescue you. Your job, a relationship, an escape, whatever it is. You've been turning to something else to, 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 to try to heal what's deep down a wound in your heart. Can I tell you this morning, only Jesus can bring that healing. Maybe this morning you find yourself with just a lack of peace in your life just this sense of, of something's not right and, and I'm trying hard, I'm doing the best I can in life, but just things aren't coming together the way I'd like them to and I just feel like my life is missing something. Can I tell you what you're missing is turning to Jesus and experiencing him as the only one who can bring you true fulfillment, true joy, true peace in your life. And no matter what the circumstances or situations you're facing are, when you turn to Jesus, you can find the peace of God that passes all understanding. You can find the joy of the Lord that can strengthen you in the times when you feel weak. You can find the love and the acceptance from a father when everybody else around you seems to be rejecting you. You can find grace and mercy for your shortcomings and for the ways that you've messed up. You can turn to Jesus and he will be your rescuer. This morning, I want to encourage and challenge each one of you that Jesus wants to rescue you. And maybe you say to yourself this morning, well, I've already received Christ into my life. I've already asked him to come and forgive me of my sins. You know what? We need Jesus no less after we ask for his forgiveness of his sins than we do before. We need to continue to live in the grace of Jesus every single day. You know why? Because as Isaiah said it, we're all like sheep who tend to go astray and who tend to walk off the path. And we need Jesus, the good shepherd, to continue hurting us and moving us in the right direction. So maybe this morning you're saying to yourself, I'm already a Christian. I'm already a follower of Jesus. Then today's a moment for you to get your eyes back on the good shepherd and say, God, whatever's lacking in my life, I know I'm only going to find in you. But maybe this morning, as you're hearing these words, you're saying to yourself, you know, my life hasn't always been what I wanted it to be. And I look at my past and I see the brokenness and the pain and the hardship that I've experienced or that I've brought into others' lives. I, I see all the, all the brokenness of sin in the world around me and I see that, that there's something missing. And this morning is an opportunity for you to say what's missing is Jesus. Maybe you need to reach out to him for the first time and say, Jesus, change and transform me. It doesn't matter if you grew up in church or if your parents were Christians or whatever it is. If you don't make that decision yourself, then you will not experience the goodness that he has in store for you. So we need to find ourselves in the place where we're turning to Jesus and him alone to be our true rescuer. So what I want to do this morning is I want to just take a few moments and, and here's what we're going to do. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to ask you to repeat a prayer after me. And as we repeat this prayer, this is just a way for us to express to God once again, Jesus, I need you. Come and forgive me of my sins. Set me on the new path to life. This is just a way for us to express this. And if you're already a follower of Jesus, I want to ask you to pray this prayer with me. And as you pray this prayer, it's simply a way of you committing yourself again today that Jesus, you are the only one who can give me hope. You are the only one who can give me rescue. And it's a way for you to just again cement that commitment in your life. But if you're hearing these words 
and you're saying to yourself, I've never made that commitment, as we pray this prayer, it's simply a way for you and your heart to say, God, I need that rescue for myself. And as you pray this morning, Jesus will meet you in a powerful way. He will change and transform your heart. He'll wash away your sin. It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter what mistakes you've made. It doesn't matter how unworthy you feel. Jesus paid the penalty for your sin. And now he just wants to offer you the new life that only he can give. It's like having a debt You know, I I didn't pay my house payment for several months and now I've racked up this great debt and the bank is about to show up and take my house. It's like Jesus coming and saying, I've got the money, I'm gonna pay for all the debts. Yes, you didn't pay. Yes, the sin was real, but Jesus paid the penalty. And now he's saying, I'm offering you a new life where you're set free. So please, in the next few moments, what I'm asking you to do is I'm gonna lead us in this prayer. Repeat after me this prayer, not as a way to just repeat a prayer, but as a way for you to express to Jesus, my life needs to be anchored in you. And as we pray this prayer, I believe Jesus is going to meet with us each one in a powerful way to refocus us on him if we're already his followers or to turn our eyes to him for the first time if we are not living for him. So will you repeat this prayer after me? Dear Jesus, thank you for all you've done for me. Thank you for coming to this earth, for humbling yourself, for living a perfect life and for dying a death you didn't deserve. God, thank you for going to the cross, for being a sacrifice for my sins, for paying the penalty that I deserved. Jesus, I need you. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin and set me free to a new life of following you. Lead me from this day forward. Change my heart and make me new. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Our worship team's gonna lead us now in a song reminding us of the great love of Jesus that changes everything. So will you stand with me as they lead us and may this be a response from our hearts to say, God, thank you for this great love. Help me to experience it and live in it every single moment. Hallelujah, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for your great love for us that is overwhelming, that is never ending, that is reckless in the sense that you didn't sit back in safety and hope for us to figure it out, but you dove in and when it cost you your very self, God, you gave everything for us. Thank you for that great love, Jesus. Now, God, we turn to you and we need you to change and transform our hearts. Thank you for being the right kind of rescuer. Help us simply to connect to you and to allow you to bring us this new life that you have in store for us. Jesus, may every single day of our lives, may we be anchored in the cross, anchored in the reality that you were the right kind of rescuer and you were the only rescuer that we could truly trust in. So Jesus, we do that today as we leave from this place. God, I pray that we would carry that reality with us into our jobs, into our families, into our homes, into our neighborhoods. May we carry that hope and that joy with us everywhere we go. May others see it and experience it in their lives as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he smile on you and be gracious to you. May he show you his favor and give you his peace. Go in the grace of God. Have a great week. We'll see you back next week for Easter.